Oh, do you believe that he is more than enough in this house? Do you believe that his grace is sufficient for you this morning? My goodness. Would you please remain standing for the reading of God's word today? Before I read, would you greet a couple people to remind them that his grace is indeed sufficient? As you find your way back to your spot this morning, please allow me to begin the message by reading from Genesis chapter 8. Our focal point for today's message is verses 20 through 22. God's word says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelt the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Would you join me in prayer as we seek to understand God's word together? Father, we praise your holy name. Father, we praise you that today there is joy in knowing that our God is with us. We praise you today that you are indeed enough and sufficient, that your goodness, your mercy, your sacrifice has been enough for us to be able to have eternity with you. But today, Lord, as we gather here, we seek your Holy Spirit to reveal to us the words of wisdom that come from your truth. Lord, would you speak to every one of us today? Would you allow the words that are preached be the words that you want people to hear? God, would you allow this time to be a time where we find our satisfaction in you, where we find our peace in you, where we find our pleasure in you, Jesus? May it be a time where we offer to you our wholehearted worship, sitting at the feet of our Savior, saying, Lord, speak to me. Would you speak to us, Jesus? We pray this in your holy and precious name, Lord. Amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Man, I am glad you are here. If you have your Bibles, would you open up to the book of Genesis chapter 8? If you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back. Just make sure our ushers see you to bring you one. And if you're using your smart devices would you make sure they are not stupid enough to ring in the middle of the service this morning <laughs> so as you open your bibles let me start with this today i i want to start with a story well while, while my wife and i we lived in istanbul some years ago we got to know a guy through church and by also walking on the streets quite often we got to know a guy named emmanuel from africa he was a refugee from africa who had lived a really hard life and he was, he, he, we would see him often at church or we would walk on the street, busy streets of Istanbul and he worked at an antique shop just doing labor and we would see him every time and he would always greet us with the warmest smile. But he had lived a hard life. He was one of the only survivors from his family and he was waiting for the United Nations to give him refugee status so that he could have a better life. So over the course of time that he lived in Istanbul, a hard life, he worked at this antique shop and raised money as much as he could. And after a while, we began to notice that he has disappeared from the face of the earth. So we inquired of him. We knew it couldn't be the United Nations that had sent him because United Nations doesn't work that fast. And we knew that he was missing for a while, and nobody knew where he was. So for a few months, we never saw him, and we inquired about him until one day, the, one of the missionaries that was close to him informed us that Emmanuel had mustered up all the cash that he had saved, and he had given the cash to smugglers, to give, to, had given the cash to them to take him from Istanbul to Greece, passing through the Aegean Sea to the other side, so with the hope that maybe his life would be better as he was waiting for the United Nations to give him an answer and they would not deal with his case. 
But as he had tried to cross over, the smugglers had taken his money along with the money of so many others, and they had put them in a shipping container and dumped them all in the Aegean Sea and killed them. And listen, I start with this horrible story because I realize it might bother some of us, and it should. But I start with this for two reasons. One, because we just read that God said the intention of man's heart is evil from the youth. We saw that just right as we read this. But the second thing that I hope that we can try to look at the story that I just shared with you as an allegory or as a way to correlate with our own story. What if Emmanuel's life in Istanbul, as hard as it may have been, was the period of grace that God has set him in a place to wait upon the Lord? And when we try to take matters into our own hands, what happens? Chaos and commotion usually happen. Death is a byproduct of not waiting for the Lord. What if the season of waiting that each one of us are in, what if that, that area of life where we think, why, when, I, why can, when can I come past through this season is a time of grace and you're missing it? And today, that's what we're going to look at in the story of Noah. It's the precise opposite of the story I shared with you this morning. The story of Noah is the opposite of how Noah responds to God's grace. Now, here's the thing. Some of you may look at the story of Noah. I've heard this before. People say, oh, no, Noah's story is not a story of grace. Noah built an ark because God told them to build an ark. Noah got in the ark because God told them to go in the ark. It's not a story of grace. It's a story of obedience. Now, you have part of it right if you think that. But it is also a story of grace because God did not have to choose Noah. God did not have to let Noah live. God did not have to let his family live. The very fact that God gives you and I an opportunity today to sit in a church, to fall and worship the King of glory, it is God's grace. He does not have to give any of us a chance, but yet he has chosen those of us who believe in him to sit at his feet and worship him. That is God's grace. Now, the obedience is a byproduct of grace. So I want to begin by asking this question of you this morning, which you ask yourself. How do I respond to God's grace? How do you respond to God's grace? What is your response towards God's grace? How do you operate when you know what God's grace is like? Now, the modern church teaches us that all I got to do to respond God, to God's grace is to say a quick prayer. And I am saved. I am in God's grace. However, that is a messed up theology. Because grace is the very thing that changes a man or a woman from the inside out. Grace is the thing that transforms you to a new creation. Grace is the thing that brings you the hope of glory. Grace is the thing that allowed Noah to build an ark, to be in the safety of an ark, to be able to come at some point out of that ark because grace is what it does, what does that for us. So how do you respond to God's grace is what we're going to look at today. My hope is that we can learn five lessons from this passage today, okay? Five lessons that allow us to, to examine how do, we, how, we, how do we respond to God's grace just looking at the story of Noah. Is there anybody in this house excited about God's Word? Yeah. All right, if you're excited, I am even more excited, okay? If you're excited, open up your Bibles, uh, Genesis chapter 8, Last week, we stopped at verse 4 and 5, but we looked at the fact that God sent the flood for 40 days, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And as it rained for 40 days, 40 nights, then the rain is stopped, and it says that on the end of the 150th day, at the seventh month, on the 17th of the month, the ark rested. That's verse 4. It says the ark rested somewhere on Mount Ararat. And then in verse 5, I will have this on the screen, but I will say it to you. In verse 5, it says, on the 10th month, the top of the mountains became visible. Now, that's a clue that it gives you what's going on. And this is where we're going to start now. So on the 10th month, the top of the mountains became visible. Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right, verse 6. Genesis chapter 8, verse 6 is at the end of 40 days. Now, let me pause for a second right here. 40 days, this confuses some people. Is this the 40 days of rain or is it the 40 days after 150th day? Well, there is some dispute on this. However, I, I would tell you Nasser's perspective theology on this. We saw that in verse 5, it says the top of the mountains became visible. It appears to me that Noah waited another 40 days. He waited another 40 days, it appears to me, before he takes action to do the next steps. Now watch this. It says, at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a, this is an important one, sent out of what? Rain. 
a raven. Send out a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Meaning the raven never came back. It just went around, flew around, probably found a resting spot, maybe on top of the visible mountains. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. So let's, let's talk about this for a few moments. Most of scholars who study this agree on the fact that the fact that Noah sent out a raven and a dove was not an act of faithlessness. And most of us have read this, we have never thought about it like that. But the question is, if he's in the safety of the ark, and his family is in the safety of the ark, why does he send these two birds out? What do they represent? Okay, now, I want to give you the first lesson on this, how we respond to God's grace, and hopefully I can explain it to you. Okay, are you guys with me? Yeah. Lesson number one, a proper response to God's grace is a spiritual awareness of your surroundings. One of the responses that you give to God's grace is that you become aware, now important, aware, not indulging in your surroundings. You become aware of what's going on in your surroundings. You don't become drowned in them. But what you do is you explore to see what's going on. Now, when I say that, I got to be careful because some of you are like, yeah, that's why I watch the news. <laughs> news is not being aware of your surroundings. It's you hearing what they, wanna, what they want you to hear. Being aware of your surroundings means that you are paying attention to your community. What's going on in the community? How can I be the hands and feet of Jesus? Who is drowning in there? How can I save them? Being aware of your circumstances, knowing what the schools are teaching your children so that you can counter the falseness that they're teaching them. Being aware means that you are not walking in the darkness of this world, but you know that if you are sitting in God's church, if you are sitting in that ark and walking in that ark, you are in the grace of God. Praise be to God who has saved you through it so you're aware that there's darkness around you that's why Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 and 16 says look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil how would I know the days are evil if I if I'm not aware of my situations of my surroundings listen I look at our community and I see a lot of evil I see drug addictions I see wickedness I see things that are happening but yet we are not indulging in ourselves in them. We are trying to be a place where people can find safety. Now, a quick side note. Is that okay to go on a side note? Yeah. This raven and dove is interesting to me. <laughs> there has been a lot of allegories over the course of the years. People have said the raven represents evil because it's an unclean animal. The, the dove represents good, so Noah sent out the evil first and he good, good came back to him. Those allegories are all great, okay? I, however you want to interpret it. But I, I just think when God does something or writes something in His Word, there is something in it. And there's power. And I was doing some, re I spent quite a bit of time on this, not for preaching's sake, but for my own sake because I love it. And I, I discovered that science has recently just come to discover the, the, the strength of a raven's mind. In 2018, National Geographic released an article that said, the t title of the article was, Why the Ravens and Crows are the Smartest Birds on the Earth. And it's amazing because the article goes on along with so many other research shows that a raven at age four months is smarter than a full-grown ape. It can solve problems using tools. So when Noah sends out a raven, and it was considered an unclean animal because ravens are agents of cleansing the earth, they are the ones who eat decaying and dead flesh. So when Noah sends out a raven, this is powerful to me. God is above science. Think about this. When Noah sends out a raven, a raven, if the raven had returned, Noah would know, oh, we are still in trouble. But the fact that the raven doesn't come back means that everything God had said had come true because the raven has enough food to eat, has a hiding place to hide. It can survive. But when he sends the dove out, dove needs the seeds. Dove needs somebody to take care of it. So the dove comes back, meaning, again, that God's promises are being fulfilled. You guys with me? Yeah. So through all of this, now here's the thing. As you become aware of your surroundings, Test the surroundings. Sometimes you need to be in a situation where you see the wickedness and you have to still wait. Now, verse, verse 10 says, this is important. I need your help with this one. He did what? 
I'm sorry, what did he do? He waited. He waited. That's hard. He waited. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah, the important, did what? <laughs> Noah knew. Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. If you know it, why don't you just get out? Then he waited another seven days, and he sent forth the dove, and this time she did not return to him anymore. Now, this is another side note before I give you the second lesson, but I, this is worth some exploring on your own, okay? I'm not going to spend time on this. But did you notice the dove goes out the first time, comes right back. The dove goes out the second time, brings a fresh olive leaf. The third time, dove doesn't come back. The only reference in the Bible that we have when a dove returns is when Jesus is baptized and the Spirit of God ascends on Jesus and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. That is worth exploring. So I hope you spend some time exploring that, but I'm not focusing on that at the moment. But if you're note takers, I want you to write down lesson number two. A proper response to God's grace is gratefulness for the boundaries that God established. Did you notice this is Noah waited? I'm telling you, as you, you would be out of that ark. The second you saw that, that fresh leaf, I would be out of that ark. I have been stuck in this ark for this whole time. Let's get out of here. But Noah waits and waits. And I'm telling you, a proper response to God's grace is to be patient. It's to wait for God to tell you when you can get out. In fact, it is because of that kind of patience. It is because of those boundaries that God has said the ark was the boundary. They had to be within that boundary. And it is because of those boundaries that God says for you that you know how to choose right friends. It is because of those boundaries that you know how a proper relationship should look like. It is because of those boundaries that you know what a marriage should look like. It is because of those boundaries that God sets that you know what godliness really looks like. So instead of always wanting to break the boundaries, you and I need to give God praise that He has placed us in the safety of Himself. We need to give Him praise for that. And we need to remember what the psalmist says in Psalm 100 verse 4. He says, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. But you and I, you know what we do? We always like, can I get out now? Can I break this boundary now? But the ark is the boundary. And even though now, this is amazing, it's written to remind you, even though now Noah can say, well, I can get out now. He still waits. Now watch this. You still with me? Yeah. Verse 13. In the 601st year, that is the 601st year of his life, this is important. In the first month of the first, and the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering, I don't know what covering looked like, of, of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Now let me pause for one second. Did you notice what it says? On the first day of the first month, the waters are dried. This is important. You guys with me on this? Yeah. I want to make sure you're getting this. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Look at verse, the next verse. In the second month, on the what? That's another month and 27 days. The waters were dried. On the seventh, second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out, and important, then, what, 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 what? Then God said, then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast and every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by family families from the ark. Now, lesson number three, real quick. A proper response to God's grace, you should already know this, is patiently waiting for God's direction. Oh, we know this real well. <laughs> but it's one of the hardest ones, isn't it? We know we are in God's grace. We know that we can live in His grace. We know we should wait for His direction, but yet we do whatever it takes to break that boundary. We do whatever it takes to walk out of that grace because we often think that the grace is the prison. We often think like that. But here's the amazing thing. Y'all thought you had it bad during COVID. Can you imagine 
for a whole year or more. I don't know. I don't know exactly how many days because the years of Hebrew calendar were different. But it's about a year, give or take some days. For a whole year, Noah and his family are stuck in the ark. Can you imagine, if you go to this direction, there is your daughter-in-laws, and you're dri driving, you're crazy. If you go that direction, your wife maybe is saying something you don't want to listen to. If you go to the other direction, there is your sons who are driving you nuts. And if you go over there, there's stinky animals. If you go to the other direction, you are a daughter-in-law, your mother-in-law is on the other direction. If you go to the other direction, your husbands are all chatting and saying nonsense. If you go to the other direction, the animals are all stinky. Can you imagine for a whole year, no matter where you go, you are being driven crazy and you're saying, can I please walk on some land this morning? For a whole year, listen, if anybody's patience is tested, is their patience. But here's what I want you to see as well. Don't take my word for this. Do your own research. I'm not going to put this on the screen. But did you, if you pay attention, in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, God said to Noah, I am sending a flood. God has spoke. It says, in seven days, I'm sending a flood. In chapter 7, verse 16, Noah and the family get into the ark, and the Lord shuts them in. Don't take my word for this, but there is absolutely no record for God to speak to Noah in between that whole year until you get to verse 15, 14 and 15 in Genesis chapter 8. For a whole year, they don't hear the voice of God. But yet they have to wait for God to speak to them before they get out. Now, here's the thing. Two things. This may be a side note real quick, but for some of us, we complain, well, I, I'm not hearing God's voice. I am not hearing God speak to me. I am not hearing God giving me directions, and, and I'm not speaking about an audible voice necessarily. But you're saying, I just don't know if God is giving me direction. I don't understand. And it could be for two reasons you're not hearing what God has for you. Number one, you have not yet finished the previous assignment that God has given you. It's possible that the reason God is not giving you direction right now is that you haven't done what he has already given you to do. Number two is that you haven't yet obeyed the commandment he already gave you in the first place. For Noah, can you imagine if he hadn't started building an ark, do you think God would have continued talking to him? If he's not going to listen, that judgment is coming, well, go do whatever you want. Because you're going to be consumed by the judgment. So it's possible that if you're not hearing God's word, you are not yet finished. You have not yet finished the assignment, or you have not yet obeyed the assignment in the first place. And here's the th crazy thing. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. On all of those other things that you're looking for, they'll be added to you. All of those things will be added to you. What does that mean? It means that God's commandment in the first place for you is to seek him. And if you're not seeking God, guess what? You're not going to hear from God. You're not going to know the directions it's going to give you. You're going to miss all of it, and you're going to break out of that ark allegorically. And you're going to find yourself in chaos and disaster. Are you still with me? Yes. Listen, three people are with me. Thank you. <laughs> Lesson number four, if you're note takers, a proper response to God's grace is cautiousness versus hastiness. And this is another thing that a lot of people think, you know what, I'm a Christian, God has got me. No, God still calls you to be cautious because remember, the world around us is wicked. We are not to act hastily. Say, yes, the ground is dry, now I can get out. Now, this is powerful. I want to make sure you're seeing this. Are you, see are you with me for a moment? Yeah. This is powerful. Notice that when God speaks to Noah and says, all right, it says, then God said, verse ver verse." Um, would you put that verse on the screen? Yeah, verse 15 and 16. Then God did what? God then God said to Noah, now watch this. Go out of the ark. Is that where it stops? No, because God has to actually tell them, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. And I think if God had not said all that, the kids would stay. I'm sorry, I ain't going out there. God has to actually tell them what to do. Otherwise, they're not going to do it probably because they are too scared of the judgment they have just seen. And here's the thing. We, we oftentimes, instead of having that fear of judgment that is coming, we become so hasty in our decision making. And we're like, I am out of here. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 16 says, One who, who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. Which one are we? Are we fools? who recklessly step into the chaos in the world, say, you know what? I know there's a bar. I'm just going to go to it anyways. I know there's, uh, my friends are, are going to smoke something. I'm going to go join them anyways. Are you hasting in making a decision, or are you waiting for the Lord to tell you, now you can step out of the ark? 
Now you can step out of this zone and go to the next place. Are you waiting for the Lord? I'm almost done. Almost done, I promise you. Can you give me a few more minutes? Yeah. Lesson 20. This is, this is where you want to wake up. This is the most important part. Lesson 20. Excuse me, verse 20. The Noah built... Oh, come on, let's try this together. This, this is the most important part. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And if you go later, which we're going to study next week, then God establishes the covenant with Noah and his family. But that's for next week. We're not going to focus on it right now. Right now, I want to focus on responding to God's grace. Did you know this? That when Noah walks out of the ark, the first recorded thing that we have in the Bible is what? He builds an altar to worship the Lord. And some people get confused because when you read your Bible, you didn't pay close attention maybe to it. Say, so hold on a second. Did he offer animals? Wasn't there two by twos? Well, you missed that if that's what you were thinking. Because I, this, is, this is so fascinating to me. Because God had already anticipated the worship of Noah when he walks out of the ark. That in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, this is what God's word says. It says, take with you seven pairs of all clean animals. The male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, meaning that God had already anticipated that Noah was going to worship him with these animals as sacrificial offering. So he had already provided what Noah needed to use to worship him with. And I'm telling you this because I believe God has already provided for you what you need to use to worship him with. And if you're not doing it, then there is something wrong, not with you, not with God, but with you. God has already provided everything you need. And here's the crazy thing in the midst of all of that. Most of us, we would walk out of the ark and say, hold on, I do, I do know I have seven animals of each one of the clean animals, but i got to have something to eat. And we would withhold from giving it to the Lord. But Noah offers that to God sacrificially. Why? Because it is God's. And here's my final lesson. It is a simple lesson. You have heard this so many times, but a proper response to God's grace is sacrificially bringing offerings of worship to God. Sacrificially. Now, here's the thing. I know you look at me and say, but I don't, I don't have animals to offer. Good. Jesus already paid it all. That's not what we're looking for. But do you come to the Lord with an offering of worship? Maybe for you that offering of worship is maybe for you it's just coming to church and singing a praise song with all of your heart and lifting the name of Jesus. In fact, the reason why we come to church is to sing the name of Jesus together. That's an act of bringing to Him in the altar of His worship, in His altar of His grace, giving to Him what He already deserves. Maybe for some of you it is just going to church and, and, or serving once a week or once a month in a ministry without grumbling, oh man, i got to serve again. Instead, offering to God what He has already blessed you with, with a wholehearted sense of worship because you are in the grace of Jesus. Maybe for some of you it is just showing an act of kindness to somebody who doesn't deserve that kindness. Or maybe for some of you, is financially giving. If God has provided you financially with whatever you have, He has already provided anticipating that you would give to Him what you ought to give to Him. Or maybe for some of you, simply the act of coming to the altar is something the church doesn't do much these days, is to fall before the King of Kings and kneel before Him in worship. Say, God, You are my King, and I would never kneel before anybody else but You, Jesus. Maybe that's, that's what we got to do. Did you hear what it says? This is when God heard the pleasing aroma of the sacrifice. And that's not the first time we hear this in the Bible. In Psalm chapter 141, verse 2 says, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting and the lifting up of my hands as the having of sacrifice, of evening sacrifice. 
And you know what is am- amazing? You get to the end of the scripture, and in Revelation says that the angels are before the king. Before the God of glory. It says they are holding in one, the, one of their hands, each is holding a harp, and in the other one a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And here's the amazing thing. Listen to me. This is what I want to finish with. As Noah offers the sacrificial offering, the incense, the pleasing aroma, God establishes a covenant. I will never do this kind of a flood ever again. As you offer to the Lord the worship and the sacrifice, God will also look at your offering and say, because of them, I will not curse so and so. You have to remember that. We have to remember that, that our worship, our offering to the Lord, our response to His grace enables other people to receive God's grace as well. So what do you do with that? What is your response to God's grace? In a moment, I'm going to pray for us. I, I encourage you with this. Praise the Lord wherever you are. The prayer team is going to come up here, and you can join them and pray with them. Maybe you're dealing with things in your life. You need somebody to pray for you. That's great. Maybe you need somebody to just help you to respond to God's grace because you say, you know what? I don't even know how to respond to God's grace. My life has been chaos. I've been pushing boundaries. I have been impatient with the Lord. I just need God to hold me and drag me back into His safety. If that is you, come pray with somebody. Come talk to us during the week. But if you're in a place in your life that you say, you know what, I am just grateful to the Lord and I want to bring my offering of worship to the Lord. Maybe you can sit down for a moment and give Him praise. Or kneel before Him if you can. Kneel before the King of glory or sit wherever you are sitting and give God glory and honor. Let your worship be counted as incense before the King. Let me pray for us. Father, I kneel before you this morning. I kneel before you as the King of glory. Jesus, we give you praise that today we get to understand you better through your word. To understand that you are the only God who gives us sufficient grace. You are the God who provides for us safety. You are the God who gives us patience. You are the God who gives us boundaries so that we would remain safe. God, you also provide us with opportunities to see our surroundings and see the chaos and the commotion in them and remember that we can praise you for the safety of your presence. So Jesus, we call upon your name, the name above all names who is worthy of all praise, the God of mercies, the God of righteousness, the God who loves us so much that you became the boundary for us, that you became the punishment for us, that you became the one who died on the cross so that we would be in the safety of our master, Jesus. So God, we give you praise today. I pray for every soul here that today, throughout the week, they would remember that your grace is sufficient for them. That God, you did not have to choose them, you did not have to give them grace, you did not have to call them, but here they are today, hearing this, reading these verses, and remembering that you love them. And that if they are in this room today, they are in your safety. May they take a hold of that, maybe not become impatient with you, Jesus. Lord, I give you all praise. We as a church give you all praise and glory. Be magnified in our lives. In your holy and precious name I pray. Amen.